Thank you very, very much. We're starting a new series today for the month of May, focused on the life of Elijah. And the uh, title of the whole series is Elijah, a man just like us, just like you and me. And today we're looking at 1 Kings 17 in particular. And the topic we're going to look at from that passage is where where is God when our survival is threatened, when we feel deeply threatened, vulnerable, and, uh, and the future is uncertain, where is God? That's uh, what we're looking at here today. So before we get into what I have to share, share let me ask you, uh, what do you know about Elijah? He had a big um, dispute with the prophets at the time. He and, did. Um, and he called, they, they were cutting themselves and um, going around like uh, Red Indians, if you like. <laughs> And, um, you know, they still couldn't bring the fire down from heaven and Elijah brought it down. Okay, so had a big confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Yeah, that's right. Asa Oge Asagi, same thing. He, he had moments of immense faith and moments of no faith, just yes. like us. <laughs> yes, just like us, right. The peaks and the troughs were very extreme with Elijah and we will talk about it. Thank you for having us all, Wind. Taken up to heaven in the whirlwind. I think he was a fast runner, maybe. <laughs> Olympic athlete. Second, Tim, Second Kings 2. We'll get to that later on in the series. He was a wanted man, wasn't he? The king at the, um, at the time didn't like him at all. And, and the, yeah, so his life was constantly in danger. He was a wanted man. If they were doing it those days, they'd have been putting up posters all over Israel. Wanted this man. Uh, one of the greatest prophets, Taiwo, performed seven great miracles. That's very interesting. You're right, seven, uh, which is uh, significant, but we'll have to come back to that another time. The chariot of fire, Esther, yeah, that's right, Second Kings 2. He, 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 appeared with, um, Mo he appeared with Moses, with Jesus. Yes, that's right. So out at the mountain, uh, Moses and Elijah appeared and talked with, hung out with Jesus. I'm, I'm going to have to look it up. I, uh, perhaps, Dad, you might know. Um, isn't there a Jewish celebration where a seat is still put out for Elijah? Ah, I'm yes. Like, okay. Have that's I got correct. That completely wrong? I no, that's correct because the idea that Elijah has still not, because the prophecy is that Elijah will come before the Messiah and herald yeah. the Messiah. And so the Jews still are waiting for the new Elijah to emerge. And what the New Testament tells us is that John the Baptist actually fulfilled that function. He was the yeah. Elijah to herald the Messiah. But yes, yeah. you're quite right, Becky. They do still have that um, idea. Mm. He passed on his mantle to Elisha with a double portion. That's right, Taiwo. Yep. And he had a disciple. Yes, S uh, Simon, called Elisha, who was also awesome. He was. Okay, let me play you a short video clip of uh, an excerpt from a Bible project video. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, 0 for 20. And then in southern Judah, only 8 out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. 
Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. I'm really excited to bring this series together because I've often preached on parts of Elijah's life but I've never looked at the totality of his life and I've never preached through the, his life and I don't think I've ever heard anybody else preach through his life. So I think and I hope I'm learning things from this study. I hope we're all going to today and uh, and learn something that'll be useful for us from uh, from his life. So he is powerful yet very human as uh, we already talked about. He had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. He's somebody said he's a bit like uh, Elijah's a bit like an Old Testament superhero. He spoke and acted in, in ways that were powerful and miraculous and he was taken up to heaven, didn't experience death in the normal way. But also uh, when Jezebel threatened him, which we'll come on to another time, he just ran away and got terrified and got depressed. Highest of highs and the lowest of lows, much like us at different pay, uh, stages of our life and maybe even right now. Maybe you're on a real high, maybe you're on a real low and you're just stuck and you don't feel like you've got any hope and where is God and we all have times when it seems like everything's swimming going swimmingly and we have other times when our very survival feels under threat and Elijah can understand us and I think what he learned in his relationship with God I hope can help us as well and one of the other reasons why I wanted to look at Elijah is because of these highs and lows it fits together with the uh, teaching things we're doing this month in our videos on mental health and emotional well-being and spirituality and the men looked at one last week the women will be looking at the first one this coming Wednesday and I think Elijah is somebody who can also relate to those times of emotional challenge or even mental health issues I'm not saying Elijah had a particular perhaps mental health diagnosis we could make not that but but that, that sense of instability and vulnerability that often comes with these things I think it's very significant and in our culture and even in the church we're faced with greater challenges to our emotional well-being and our mental health maybe than ever before. It's been very interesting that as I've posted the videos about mental health and emotional well-being last week and another one's coming up, uh, I've posted two of the same version, different versions of the same one, I've had more views and more comments on the podcast and the video than anything I've posted for a very long time. So we know that a lot of people are feeling very vulnerable right now and also as we come out of the pandemic and readjust to not quite the old life we used to have I think but a new version of the old life there are still a lot of uncertainties going on. So the first reason we're looking at Elijah is because I think he can relate to us and we can relate to him and find strength from his relationship with God uh, through the highs and the lows. The second reason we're looking at Elijah is because of his relationship with Jesus or connection with Jesus. As I think was it Danny mentioned, he was on the mountain uh, with Moses and Jesus in Luke chapter 9. They're up there on the mountain. They appeared, it says, uh, in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. 
they spoke about his departure. You remember? Interesting, Elijah is taken up in the chariot. Well, of course, Jesus ascended into heaven. There's some parallels there. And an interesting Bible study would be to look at the life of Elijah and the life of Jesus and looking for parallels. Anyway, they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And the third reason we're looking at Elijah is because he was a man of prayer. When you read through the narrative of Elijah's life, one of the emphases is his prayer life. And of course, that's one of the reasons why he's mentioned in the New Testament in James chapter 5, a passage many of us will know, which says that Elijah was a human being, even as we are, or uh, the old NIV translation, just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. And that's from James chapter 5, where James is encouraging people to pray with faith, pray for the sick, pray for the needy, pray for whatever's going on. And he cites the example of Elijah. So that's another reason why we're going to be looking at Elijah, because I think personally, and I think you probably agree with me, this is a time when prayer is so important. There are so many things we've been going through that are challenging. There's so many adjustments we're all making. Where is God in all this? Just hearing about what's going on in India with COVID and in our sister congregations over there. So many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have, are dying. And where is God in all this? We need prayer. We need more than prayer as a thing. We need God in prayer. We need to connect with God in fresh and deeper and more powerful ways, perhaps than we have recently. There's an uncertain future, so we need more prayer and connection with God. So that's why we're looking at Elijah, and I hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I've already been enjoying studying it. So that's what we have here. So the first thing we're going to see in this passage, going back to 1 Kings 17, so where are we starting here in 1 Kings 17? I think we're going to see two things today uh, that I want to bring out, and I hope they're helpful. Firstly, the first thing we see here is we see God's kindness. We see God's kindness. Now, back in the passage here in 1 Kings 17, it talks about Elijah the Tishbite. By the way, he just appears on the scene here. There's no introduction, no, you know, he was from this and that, and he, these were his parents. And it's just Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Galilee said to Abraham, he's like, right, it's time for a confrontation. It's like God's had enough, right? Ahab, you've been going your own way for long enough. It's time for me to send the Tishbite to have a chat with you. And so he, he sends Elijah the Tishbite, from Tishba and Gilead, and he goes to Ahab and he says, as the Lord, and that's Yahweh here, as Yahweh, the God of Israel lives, or he lives, he's not a dead God, he's not an absent God, as he lives, whom I serve, because in contrast to Baal, who's a made up God and didn't live, but anyway, Yahweh, the God of Israel, which is supposed to be your God, by the way, forget about Baal, he's, Yahweh's your God, the only reason you're here and the Israelites are here is because of Yahweh, but anyway, the Lord, the God of Israel, your God, lives, is not dead. Whom I serve, right, he's mine, should be you serving him too, but we'll get on to that. There will be as a sign, right, neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And God's told him to go and do this and say this to Ahab and says, drought, famine, it's, that's the situation because of the drought and famine of God in this land. Because you, Ahab, are not being the king you're called to be. So a great confrontation here, right at the beginning. And Elijah has a, I think, has a very strong sense of identity. And this is something that's important for you and me right now. How do we, how do we process our identity as we go through struggles? Elijah's name means the Lord is my God. Eli, Yah, the Lord is my God. That's what his name means. Imagine that. That's your name. My name is, my name is the Lord is my God. Hi. Nice to meet you. My name is, what's your name? My name is, the Lord is my God. It might sound a bit strange to us, but it's very deliberate here. God has given him this name, I believe, and called him so that he could say to Ahab, I'm saying to you what you should be saying. You should be saying the Lord is my God. Every time he hears Elijah's name, you can imagine Ahab going a bit mad because he's, he's like, ah, that name again, Elijah, the Lord is my God. The Lord is his God, should be my God, but I don't want to let that in my head. I, he's got, I'm sure he's got some guilt. We'll see later in the story, not in, se in chapter 17, but later on. He has some awareness of God, and it must have been a, a real pebble in his shoe every time Elijah is either, either turns up like this out of the blue, uninvited, by the way, or just um, or someone mentions uh, him to him. He reminds Ahab, and he, this reminds 
Elijah, in his name reminds him that his whole existence and identity is owed to the Lord. You know, I think in some ways, perhaps as Christians, we ought to change our name when we get baptized into Christ. We should put Jesus as a middle name in there somewhere or Christian or something like that as a middle name. You get an extra middle name because we're not. No, I'm no longer Malcolm Cox, Malcolm Colin Cox, my middle name. I'm not only Malcolm Colin Cox. I'm Malcolm Colin Christian Cox or I'm Malcolm Colin belongs to Jesus Cox, aren't I? See, that's this. Our name has so much means so much to us. Whether you like your, the name your parents gave you or not, it means so much. But we've, we have a new identity. And that's what Elijah definitely has. And he feels it strongly. And I think it's one of the things that gives him the confidence to go and f fulfill his first calling from the Lord, which is to go and confront not a neighbor who's annoying us, not an old friend, but the king, King Ahab, who had the power, of course, to put uh, Elijah to death. And he goes and he has a confrontation with him. Because Baal, who's the god that Ahab is worshipping, he's the god supposedly of storm, fertility. He's supposed to be present in the dew and the rain. That's part of what Baal's supposed to do. And Yahweh, but through Elijah, is directly challenging him and saying, you think Baal is in charge of the dew and the rain? Let me show you who's really in charge of the dew and the rain, okay? Uh, Elijah is issuing a challenge. It's like he's saying, okay, Ahab, come outside for a fight if you want one. Baal and Yahweh, we're going to see who wins this one. No problem. So Elijah has a lot of courage here. Very courageous to step out of his comfort zone, to step away from his life in in um, in Tishba, to, to go to Ahab and say, it's time for a fight. He doesn't know the outcome. I mean, for all he knows, he's going to go and, and confront Ahab and be killed. Some of the other prophets have been killed. He doesn't know if he's going to be protected or not. God hasn't told him you're going to be safe. And uh, in fact, also, Elijah doesn't know the consequences of the famine on him either. He's, he, he doesn't know... He doesn't know if he's going to be okay through this famine, this drought, uh, the lack of rain in the land. God hasn't told him, go and pronounce this uh, famine in the land and go and confront Ahab and A, I won't let him kill you and B, I won't let you starve. God has not said that. And this is so true in our, in our Christian lives. A lot of the time, we don't know the exact outcome of living the Christian life, of living our principles, of living God's teachings and truth, of living differently from the world, of living out our morals that we believe are right from God's word. We don't know the outcome of that. God had no made no promise about ravens feeding Elijah. here. He just said, Elijah, go to Ahab and I'll take care of the rest. I wonder if you're feeling especially vulnerable at the moment. I think Elijah must have been right there, standing in front of Ahab, not knowing what's coming next. And the truth is, he knew and we know from history, an awful lot of those prophets were not protected in the same way, were they? They were not. Many of them died. Hebrews 11 talks a fair bit about that. But there's a different kind of safety from the physical safety that we so often crave. And that's the safety and security of being in God's love. Knowing he loves us. That's the ultimate security. It's the ultimate safety. In Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That last phrase, what can mere mortals do to me? That one sentence must have inspired not only people like Elijah, people in the New Testament, but people who followed Jesus uh, subsequent years and even now, people who are persecuted, people who are martyred, people who are killed for their faith. What can mere mortals do to me? That's That's got to be our motto, isn't it? It's got to be a motto for a Christian. What can mere mortals do to me? God's never going to leave you. God's never going to forsake you. He is your helper. So therefore, we need not be afraid. We may feel fear. But we don't have to give in to that fear. That's ultimately, I think, what we're being shown here by the example of Elijah. God then provides. So after this confrontation, uh, the word of the Lord goes uh, comes to Elijah once more in verse 2. 
and eat his leave here, go eastwards, and hide in the Kerith ravine east of Jordan. You'll drink from the brook. I've directed the ravens to supply you with food from there, over there. And in fact, that's what uh, he does. Where are we, by the way? Let me just give you a bit of uh, the geography of what's going on here. Uh, this is the a map of the area. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we got a place called Tishbit over here. Um, and uh, we think that the confrontation with Ahab was probably just on the west side of the Jordan. And then God sends him back, probably just the east side of the Jordan. We don't know the exact spot, but somewhere just east of the Jordan uh, in a ravine there. Later on, he's going to go up to Zarephath up in the north, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, where he goes to stay with the widow and her son. But this is the general area we're talking about here. The north of Israel, not Judah in the south, but the north of uh, in Israel. Uh, Ahab was king over this area, and Elisha came from here, roughly, and operated in this general area. Now, so uh, what are we talking about in terms of ravens? Uh, here's a picture of a raven that uh, I took a few years ago. Penny and I had a holiday in uh, on an island somewhere in uh, near the Canary Islands, and this these things are enormous. And Penny's Penny's going to come in and and tell us a little bit about ravens. Um, here, I also took this video. So that's our raven, and right, Penn, you got some things to show us? Right. Um, Amateur Productions presents... Right. How many people here think they might have seen a raven? Yeah, they're not common. What are the birds that we normally see that might look like ravens that we see in our gardens or... Doors, crows, 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 crows. I'm getting it in my ear here. Crows, a murder crows. of crows, a murder of crows. So, it, ravens are the biggest of the crow family that we have in this country, and um, and the carrion crow is the common bird that we might see, and they're all black. And I'm, I'm going to give you an idea of how big a carrion crow is. Right here we go. Right, so, so, the camera, so th yeah. this is a carrion crow, and this is this is life size. So this, it, it kind of looks quite big. If I compare it to Malcolm, right? No, big. It's about forty-five centimeters from the front of the beak to its tail, which is how birds are measured. Okay, that's a really common bird, and it, but it does look rather similar to the raven. But get this, right? This is the raven. Right. So this is this is six to four centimeters from the tip of his bill to the tail, and and if we put this next to Malcolm, Malcolm, you pretend to be Elijah. But that's a big bird to be waking up to, bringing your breakfast. Bit scary. Um, but I I just think this is so cool because um there is a bit of mythology around most animals and plants in the Bible, and we know that. The raven was seen as a symbol of God's providence. So it, technically it's a bird that likes carrion, it's a scavenger, um, but it will take eggs, it will take baby birds. But it, And there are lots in this country, but they tend to be more in remoter areas, the mountainous areas. Um, but it, it, it also featured in, uh, for any of you Game of Thrones um, fans, it, it was the raven that took the mess in between the different countries in that um, they can learn to speak although I don't know that they really understand but they can not as good as parrots but they can speak and they um, and they're very intelligent and, and one of the ways that they they feed is that they um, they they store food so some birds they know how to you know when they find a good supply they'll store a bit for later and uh, with the, the raven is the first bird named in the Bible. Um, of course, Noah sent a raven out from the ark to see if there was any dry land. And then the next appearance is here, where the raven is sent to take care of the prophet Elijah. So I know this is a raven, and our chances of seeing them around here are pretty slim. Maybe next time you see the crow, you can be reminded of God's goodness. There we go. Thanks, darling. Right, going back to my computer. She's good, isn't she? 
Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, love. The raven. So this is this is what uh, God is using to uh, to feed Elijah, and uh, apparently they 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 store food like Penny said. So they they hide it in cracks. So they go and get that. And they either, you know here. They just imagine Penny waking up to that as Penny said. And uh, here's your breakfast. <laughs> it's a raven delivery uh, breakfast for you, and. I think it's a lovely, beautiful illustration of the extraordinary way in which sometimes God provides what we need without, not in the way that we might have expected, and how God gives us just what we need. You know, he was getting some meat, and he had a brook to drink from, uh, bread and meat they were bringing him. It's not it's not gourmet uh, cuisine here. It may not be what he normally ate for breakfast uh, or what he normally drank but it is enough for what he needs and i think if we reflect on it one of the things that helps us to stay grateful as a christian is to reflect on what god has provided and supplied already you may be feeling the lack of some things a lack of money a lack of energy a lack of good health a lack of whatever it is right now but what has god supplied and i i was just thinking about this even just this morning when i was out um having a prayer just how i feel like this congregation, the Watford Church, for me is my, um, it's my, what is it, the place, my, my Kerith Ravine. I think it is, you know, I think it's, it's my, it's my Kerith Ravine that is the Watford Church, a place where God has provided, a place where God has supplied, God has supplied friends, he supplied me with wisdom from so many of you, he supplied me with support, he supplied me with friendship, comfort, uh, especially you know while my, while my mother was ill and then died. Um, comfort has come my way. Uh, material blessings from some of you that have been so kind to help out with things. Um, to me, so so you are the ravens in my life. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the ways to look at it. I think you know we we are the the God's ravens in each other's lives, aren't we? We're providing each other through God gives through us the encouragement we need, the, the, the one another Christianity that's such a prominent feature of what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, confess your sins to one another. Uh, I mean, how many of those one another scriptures are there? It's doing this, it's doing that that makes us able to experience God's compassion, God's supply, God's provision, God's kindness comes through his modern day ravens. And in so many ways, that's what we are for each other. And I'm really grateful that God has put me in this Kiriath, uh, Kerith ravine, along with all of you beautiful ravens. What a, what a joy that is. So we see, first of all here, God's kindness. Let's never lose sight of how kind God is, even in the middle of a challenge, like Elijah is facing right here. Secondly, secondly, the second part of the chapter, and most of it, is from verse 7, which is the story about the widow and her son. And secondly here, after seeing God's kindness highlighted, I think we're seeing God's power highlighted. And so where does um, God send Elijah? sends him to Zarephath. That is enemy territory. This is not Israel anymore. This is outside Israel up in the north and it's the place where Queen Jezebel comes from and you must have heard that name and that's Ahab's wife. Ahab's intensely wicked. Jezebel is on a whole nother level even above him. So she is not an Israelite. She's not a worshipper of Yahweh. She's a worshipper of Baal. She's trying to kill all the prophets. She's actively trying to kill all the people of God or God's leaders. So that's where, that's where God sends Elijah into the heart of the depths of the darkest bowels of the beast is where he is being sent. And who does he go and find there? A widow. It's interesting that he's sent to a widow. And there's lots we could say about this, but I'll just mention a couple of things. Elijah is sent to the poorest person in the whole of society. He is sent to the most vulnerable in that society. A widow was even more vulnerable than a slave, because at least a slave had an owner who was meant to take care of them. 
but a widow had no one except God. And there were laws, of course, for the Israelites about looking after the widows, but this is a Gentile. This is in a, a foreign land. And so they often did not have the same kind of protection that they would have done, hopefully, in Israel. So Yahweh is demonstrating by supplying the, the what, what the widow is challenged to, to do, where she's just gathering sticks. She hasn't even got any charcoal. She's just gathering random sticks. And Elijah says, I want, I want some food. And she says, well, I haven't got anything. And he says, well, just do it by faith. And he's calling on Yahweh, a God she doesn't know, to for her to trust him, a prophet of a, of a, of a foreign God from her perspective. And, uh, and she knows it is Yahweh, by the way, because in verse 12, she says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, as Yahweh your God lives. So she knows it's, it's Yahweh, not Baal, that she's actually being asked to trust here. God, Yahweh is demonstrating, God is demonstrating that he is able to provide for his prophet Elijah when Baal cannot provide for the people who worship him. Baal is not providing for the widow, but Yahweh is going to provide and is going to show his kindness to a vulnerable non-Israelite. It's quite radical when you think about it in that culture in that day. So we see that faith is um, rewarded. Isn't that the lesson here? I think it is. Faith is rewarded. We see a growing faith in the widow. She knows it's the God of Yahweh, but she doesn't have any reason to trust the God of Yahweh. But she does what Elijah asks. And she is called to faith twice. Firstly, by using all of her resources to, to bake, make some food. And secondly, by letting Elijah take the son when he dies and take him. He carries him upstairs to his room twice. Twice the widow is challenged to trust and have faith not over small matters like starvation is not a small matter the death of your son not a small matter life and death are at stake here and yet she has faith and i find this really challenging here is a person of baal a person not an israelite a person who doesn't know this god trusting god trusting god's man trusting the word of god coming through somebody and I think, how, how often I struggle to really trust God? How often I struggle to trust him for prayers I've prayed many times, for situations that I don't, I can't control, I can't change. Situations in church, situations in family, situations in the world that I just believe God would want to see different. And yet I, I don't have the power to, all I can do is pray. And I find, you know, this, this thing challenges me, her faith is extraordinary a great um a great inspiration and her faith is rewarded god is found to be real and powerful he looks after his prophet he feeds elijah of course he looks after the vulnerable the widow and indeed her son and god looks after the gentiles here it's uh it's a real challenge to our faith and indeed this um, bringing back to life of the boy is the first example in the Bible of someone dying and being brought back from death. It's not like Elijah has done this before. It's not like he's seen it done before. No prophet has done it before. No man of God has done it before. I mean, I, I, I know I would find it extraordinary even if I had seen it before. But for Elijah and for the whole history of his people, never been done before. God's power becomes available, is manifested, and blesses people because of faith, because of trust. Much comes from little in this chapter. Much comes from little. A lot of food from a little oil and a little flour. Much life from a dead body. It's extraordinary. I want to conclude this point by just thinking about prayer. As I, I talked earlier about how significant prayer is and the fact that Elijah's prayer life is highlighted in the New Testament. And let's look at his prayer here as he prays over the dead boy. He carries him to his upper room. And first of all, it says in verse 20, he cried out to the Lord. And it, a second time, uh, he cries out in verse 21, he cried out to the Lord. Firstly, in his prayer, we see passion. He's passionate in his prayer. Secondly, we see honesty because he cries out to the Lord 
Lord my God, have you brought this tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Is it you, God? Have you caused him to die? He's honest. He's not like, oh, God, I'm sure you'll take care of it. I know you love everybody. You know, let's just sort this out. It's like, God, did, did you do this? It's, there's a questioning going on there. I like his honesty. The third thing we see about his prayer is he's persistent. Because it says he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. You know, I'd be tempted. He's stretching himself out once. That didn't work. I've prayed. God is God. Now I'll do it a second time. All right, he stretches himself out a second time. We don't know exactly why he did this. There isn't really any precedent in the culture of the day. But anyway, he does it. He stretches himself out over the way a second time. That's twice now. Still nothing. What does he do? He doesn't give up. Okay, third time. Stretches himself out three times and cries to the Lord. Begs God for this young boy's life. He's persistent. And then he sees... And the woman sees, and the boy will be aware later as he grows up, of the miracle that God did. God was listening. God was preparing to be active. I, I, I wonder as I read this and think about this and the nature of God, I wonder what my life would be like if I really trusted that he could do what I haven't seen. I haven't seen what would, like, what would it be like if God did what I cannot and you cannot? What would it be like if God did what I haven't seen and you have never seen? What would it be like if God did more than we can imagine, I can imagine and you can imagine? Wouldn't God get the glory? The woman says at the end of this, in verse 24, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Now I know. Now I know. Elijah, you could say, was being evangelistic here by what he did, going to the widow and doing what he did. He didn't know that was the purpose of all this when he started out. But God said, go, go over there and, you know, I'll be with you. And then he's fed and he performs the miracles and God gets the glory. And a woman, a Gentile, vulnerable woman in a foreign land now knows who God is. Reminds me of the centurion when Jesus is crucified in Matthew 27, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. It was the sacrifice, the trusting sacrifice of Jesus, trusting his father that led to others being able to see and to know that he was the son of God. So for you and me, how do we live this? Well, you and I are going to figure that out for our own lives because your life of faith will be a little bit different from mine. But at least part of it is figuring out how can I live by faith? How can I live in obedience to God's word to me, even if it doesn't make sense, even if I can't see a positive outcome, even if it costs me, even if it means significant sacrifice, such that then God could use that to, to show others that he's real. What would that look like in your life this week? It's very clear in this passage, and it's emphasized that following God's word leads to God being, to God adequately supplying enough safety and enough support to his people, to Elijah and to the widow in this case. And it's partly at least because Elijah had a strong identity in God that he was able to take those, if you like, faith risks. Elijah. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, we're told that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, we looked at recently, you may remember, we're told that uh, through the promises we've been given, we participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We have a new identity. We are the royal priesthood, the holy, the children of God. Because of that identity, that, that and the spirit of Jesus in us gives us the confidence to trust him, to share our faith, to pray persistently, to forgive those who hurt us, to forgive even our enemies, to, uh, to be patient with one another and other people, uh, to live out the fruit of the spirit, to live out the beatitudes, to be a peacemaker, uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
to uh, to resist the temptations of sin and not you know like and like Joseph to suffer the consequences rather and or Moses to suffer the consequences of righteousness rather than enjoy the short-term pleasures of sin like Jesus we do our best for God even though it may hurt and may cause problems for us you and I are Christ followers we're people trying to be in a sense like Elijah someone who takes God at his word is there something in your life right now where you can sense God's trying to get my attention to live by faith trusting him rather than go the easy way the way that I've always gone here's some questions for us to think about this week how is your sense of identity in Christ do you feel secure that you are a child of God that Jesus loves you desperately the Holy Spirit is with you that God is your Heavenly Father he is your Abba and you are safe with him how strong is your identity in Christ and what could you do to strengthen it if it's a bit weak secondly in this passage who do you identify with most and why might be worth taking some time to reflect on this do you identify with Ahab do you identify with the widow or the son do you identify with Elijah uh, do you identify with the Ravens maybe who do you identify with most from this passage what is God in what ways God speaking to you through these characters second thing thirdly who could you be a raven to who could you be God's supply supply of encouragement supply of comfort supply of maybe material things I don't know who could you be a raven to this week to, to show God's kindness to that's the third thing and fourthly is this someone or something to confront by faith going back to the beginning of the chapter Elijah went to Ahab the king and confronted him and said this is not right is this someone to confront a fellow Christian a member of your family um, a work colleague a stranger maybe I mean doing it in love in love not out of anger but is this someone to confront with some truth or is there something to confront in terms of truth in yourself to face up to something and say this isn't right in my life I need to let God's truth speak to the temptations I'm struggling with the sin that I'm indulging in is there anything there to to take let let God take the fight to that sin with you and work work just work together to allow God to purify you so that you can be useful to God and be close to God in the way that God's always intended and planned and hoped and dreamed uh, that you that you indeed would be some things for us to to think about there uh, at the end of all this so uh wrapping up wrapping up i would just say this that we are so blessed and so fortunate to to have someone to follow to have jesus to follow who was willing to live in in a similar way to elijah someone willing to tr take take god at his word and and pay the ultimate price for doing for doing for us what would show us God's kindness and show us God's power showing us God's kindness by dying on the cross for our sins showing us his grace and showing us God's power because by his willing sacrifice he then enabled created the circumstances for God to show his power by raising Jesus from the dead to demonstrate his power over death and the conquest of over sin God's kindness and God's power are ours in Jesus and are ours to enjoy they're ours to enjoy and to live in and through that to show the rest of the world God's kindness and God's power I hope these thoughts have been helpful as we come now to take bread and wine let's reflect on these as Lisa would now lead us in prayer 